Today I'm speaking with Michael Ashcroft. Michael is a teacher of the Alexander Technique, having trained for three years part-time at the South Bank Alexander Technique Center in London. He's also a life coach and energy system innovation consultant, applying himself to facilitating personal as well as societal transformation. You can find out more about him and his methods on his Twitter page at M underscore Ashcroft or through his wonderful email newsletter at expandingawareness.substack.com, which I highly recommend everyone to sign up for. The ensuing conversation was a blast and we covered both the underlying theory of Alexander Technique slash expanded awareness, as well as some practical exercises and tips for you to start experimenting with these things yourself. All right, so let's get mindful. Here is the charming Michael Ashcroft. All right, so I'm here with Michael Ashcroft. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. So, yeah, so it's, it's not every day that I have the pleasure of a fellow ketogenic dieter on the podcast. <laughs> so uh, I thought for the benefit of no one, I could ask you what you had for breakfast today and we could compare. So this morning, my, my breakfast was lunch, actually, uh, and I had some nice. lettuce, avocado and some egg. That's straightforward and nice. I like that. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to preface mine by saying that um, what I choose to inhale uh, these days is purely medically driven. So kids don't try this at home, but I had unspiced chicken liver uh, on a bed of mixed lettuce, 100 grams of tallow, which is the fat from beef, and wow. more salt than any sane person would eat in a week. So it was, um, it was something. Tallow. How, yeah. do you, how do you prepare that? Is it just like you drink it? Do you cook it in some way? What's the deal there? So it's basically like you have a pound, like you have a pound of butter. It's kind of the same consistency. And then I just, I just melt it <laughs> straight in the frying pan. And then I just pour it on the lettuce. So the lettuce wow. is basically like a, uh, uh, a vehicle for me to get enough fat and enough calories in. Uh, but uh, it's kind of a struggle at this point. I mean, I'm impressed, honestly. That's, that's <laughs> the next level keto right there. <laughs> yeah, so, so I thought that we could start with uh, maybe you just giving us a little background, so who you are and what it is you do, and, and we can take it from there. Sure. So, yeah, my name is Michael Ashcroft, and I am a teacher of the Alexander Technique. Um, I should say, though, that that's actually a part-time thing. So I guess it's quite off-brand, but my, my day job is actually I'm an energy consultant in one of the big four accountancy firms. Um, so I, I advise energy system clients on the energy transition by day. And then in the evening and weekends, I am a Twitterer and AT teacher um, and whatever else feels like coming up. That's really cool. So you're, you're kind of like uh, Superman, Clark Kent at, at daytime and <laughs> Superman at night. I'll, th I'll take that. Sure. Why not? So... Um... I thought that we could start with the basics here. I'm sure you get this question a lot, but what is Alexander Technique, the way you talk about it? And, yeah. and why should we care about it? So this is, it's actually the kind of question that I would dread at a party um, because it's <laughs> difficult to answer in a, in a concise and useful way. Um, and anyone who follows me on Twitter has probably seen kind of I, I say a lot, and yet it's not immediately obvious what the thing actually is. Um, so the way I'm going to, why it's going to come out now is, as on the technique is a way to unlearn habitual ways of being. Uh, it's a way to notice how we habitually respond to things in the world, to stimuli, both internal and external, and learn mm -hmm. to say no to them in a constructive way. And then beyond that, it's once you can say no in a constructive way, like how do you then choose to be in the world in a, in a more appropriate way, a more natural way. Now that's a very good way to explain it. So, so how long have you been doing this? So I started training as a teacher in 2014, um, and I, I became a teacher in 2017, I think. Um, and I've been yeah, kind of teaching on the side uh, since then. My main activities are going back to the school where I trained um, once a month and, and helping train other other trainee teachers. Um, so I work with the people coming off the street, kind of going for a first-time lesson on, on a Saturday morning with us, 
And then I also train people who teach them at some time. Like, so, so your main way of teaching it is physically in classes, hands on. Exactly. So I, I've always been interested by the day of teaching online, but the, the profession is uh, primarily a hands on one. Um, I think with the whole uh, COVID-19 situation, the entire, uh, the entire field of Alison Technique teachers has like been scrambling to figure out how they can translate their, their, um, teaching methods to the online context. But traditionally it is done by, by a hands-on, um, kind of guided method. Yeah, right. No, and you, you've recently started with, um, your newsletter, uh, trying to figure out how to teach this best online. And I, I've been eagerly following it and I'm a, I'm a big fan. I'm Thank really you. enjoying it. And so, um, yeah. So when, when you describe what it is, uh, I know you use another term as well, expanded awareness, uh, synonymously more or less, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I don't have any direct experience with Alexander technique, but I, I have, I have experience in some other frameworks that when you describe it makes me think of them as well. So I, I was curious if, first of all, if you're aware of them and then the, the potential similarities and differences there. So the first one that c- comes to mind is the having no head, uh, the headless way rather by, by Douglas Harding, who basically emphasized the idea that in your conscious experience, you never see your own head. And this is uh, quite a brilliant uh, insight, I think. But but so he doesn't dispute that we physically have a head, but if you try to look for your own head, you'll, you'll struggle to find it in experience. And that can give rise to this expansive field of awareness where the world is where your head is supposed to be, is the way he talks about it. And another similar framework is Sam Harris, who often talks about meditation, uh, a specific form of meditation named Dzogchen, which is um, emphasizing the selfless nature of, of conscious experience. And that's also meant to kind of blast you out of a contracted uh, feeling like you're behind the head type of existence to a more expansive centerless consciousness uh, as it were so uh, yeah is this similar to what you're teaching and uh, are there any differences there that are significant sure so i mean the the headless way on having no head is actually one of the books that my own teacher peter nobes recommends um, as part of the training and when when we when i've I've read it myself and when i do the exercise of looking back at my own awareness um, from the perspective of the finger, then I, I get a kind of, I get the similar kind of experience that I'd experienced through Alexander Technique, through the expanded awareness that I'm talking about. And that right. expanded awareness is not identical to Alexander Technique. It's just a, it's a subjective experience that I have while practicing it. So it's kind of a, uh, something I can point towards as something that you would notice that you can play with, um, that is a key part of it, but it's not um, like they're synonyms or anything like that. So just going back to the headless way, when when I have that moment of um, selflessness or of headlessness, it feels a little bit blunt, I'm going to say. So it's kind of going from normal headful awareness, we'll call it that, to headless awareness, <laughs> um, yeah. where, you know, where suddenly, you know, you, you are the landscape that you're looking at. But it feels a little bit like, a, you know, on a rocket or something, you kind of go somewhere, you're not really sure how you got there. Alexander Technique training... Um, is sort of about you know how do you find other ways into that space and once you're in that space how do you consciously control it in a more specific and nuanced way right so so how would you explain uh the subjective state that alexander technique uh invites you to experience so i'll throw a few words out uh, and then we can try a couple of examples if you'd like but I, I i describe it as as kind of a wide open easy light effortless um authentic not preferencing any direction or any particular stimulus so there's a, there's a great framework um in uh, the mind illuminated where he says that awareness is the space in which attention moves around moves around mm. in so this is what we're playing with here is that, you know, if your awareness is narrowed, then your attention is constrained to this space. And if your awareness is wide open, then your attention can move around in that wider space. 
So a design technique takes you into that, that bigger space, if you like, and then your attention is free to, to go to more places. So for example, I, actually, let's, let's play with an example just before we go on to that. So the way that I've, one of the ways that I've found to get people to kind of recognize that there's something here is the experience of, you know, let's say you're, you're scrolling on Twitter, as I'm sure we all do more than we should. Um, <laughs> and you're, you're, you know, your entire awareness just collapses down into the side of the screen, maybe your hand. And, you know, you're, you're off in cyberspace in some way. And then after however long, five, 10, an hour, 10 minutes, an hour, you suddenly kind of realize that you're actually in a room and your awareness momentarily in that moment expands out. You're like, Oh, damn, I'm in a room this entire time. I kind of forgot about that. So that's the difference between expanded and contracted awareness. And you learn to consciously control the expansion, the collapse, and then the shape of it as well. Right. Yeah. This is fascinating. But so. The questions that arise for me then in my uh, uh, limited uh, expansive awareness right now is, hmm. <laughs> yeah, so so firstly, I, I know that both the frameworks that I mentioned, the, the Harding and the Harris one, they put emphasis on the ego or the I or the, the, rather the absence of any of these. The selfless nature of consciousness is what they aim to point towards. So my first question is, is... Is this something that is emphasized in Alexander Technique as well? Or can you have expanded awareness and still feel like an eye behind the face, to use Harris's uh, terminology? And then why why isn't this just mindfulness meditation then that is uh, pushing you to just notice everything around you, the open space of consciousness, and not focus on just one thing necessarily? Sure. So, I mean... My, my, my teacher's book is actually called Mindfulness in 3D um, okay. for that reason, because this, this, is, this is a basically, a, it's a mindfulness practice just with a different set of subjective experiences and a different way of getting into it and then a purpose once you're there. Um, in terms of the ego and the selflessness, that it's not an implicit or an explicit part of the practice to try to remove or reduce the ego in that language. However, I, I could ex- expand to say when you try to coordinate, consciously coordinate your body by doing things that we call sitting, standing, whatever, mm-hmm. there's a part of your brain that is doing that, that interferes in some way. And a lot of the practice on Zana technique is to undo all of that and to allow standing, sitting, walking, singing, whatever, to kind of do itself. So you can kind of analogize there that the ego is the same thing as the doer in a sense. So, so while we wouldn't use the language of, you know, reducing the ego, but you are reducing the, the, the power of that interfering doer. But is it fair to say then that the, the difference here in the frameworks then might be that um, Alexander Technique, in Alexander Technique, the loss of ego or doer is a side effect rather than uh, what you're actively trying to achieve. Like, like the main goal is not to lose yourself, it's to effortlessly move in the world rather um indeed indeed it, 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 yeah. it, you're not looking for enlightenment um explicitly yeah. <laughs> through, through Alexander technique you are looking to reduce interference you're looking to find a greater sense of ease and lightness um and effortlessness in the world Alexander called this conscious constructive control so mm. you know we've grown up with a bunch of these habits that no longer serve us or that are maladaptive and we can't consciously stop doing them um because the more we try to stop doing them the more we interfere and actually do them um, so there's a, a, a I hate phrase of middle way there um, yeah. <laughs> to, 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 to undo all of that and step out of that trap. Right. Okay. So it's meditation on steroids or mindfulness <laughs> on steroids um, in some sense. Well, okay. I mean, I've definitely, I've, I practice Zen as well. I'm not good at really practice Zen, but as much as I, I try to at least. Um, and I've had experiences where I mean, I'm walking through a park and I'm paying attention to the present moment and it's the same kind of experience I'll have with Alexander Technique. Right? So I've had a kind of Kensho experience, and actually quite common um, mm. once you you know you know where you're going. Um, for the walls between inside and outside to come crashing down, and for you just to watch your body moving itself. Um, so they they do point at the same things. They're just different frameworks, access whatever that thing is. But the, you know the, the expression, the finger that points at the moon is not the moon. I, I yeah. somewhat see Zen and other practices and AT as different fingers that point towards the same move. Uh, that's a nice way of putting it. 
And yeah, I know that another thing we have in common is our uh, affinity for the great Alan Watts. And, yes. uh, I, uh, I'm still, I'm still hoping to, at a certain age, reach the, um, the depth of his laughter because, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite things to listen to in the entire world. Right. So, yeah, I, I know that he spoke about, he also spoke a lot about the, uh, 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 the ego and how to uh, abolish the ego. And I know his theory was something along the lines of the feeling of self uh, is just a feeling of contraction, muscular tension around the chest and in the face, basically, that we accumulate when uh, when we're kids. And the t- I think he uses the example when the teacher yells, "Yeah, listen up or focus." Uh, you kind of you kind of tense your body and and you for your brow, and it doesn't help your your uh, uh, ability to perform the task at all, but but that's what you think you're supposed to do. You're supposed to try. You're supposed to force something. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, I, I think I've seen you use uh, the term non-doing in this context. Uh, at least I've seen other people speak about uh, Wu Wei, which is a Taoist uh, translation of that. But, uh, but I know Alan uh, spoke about that term. Uh, he said non-forcing instead. And I've been thinking about the term non-doing and I feel like it is perhaps unnecessarily ambiguous and confusing because at least in my head it feels like yeah you you're you're promoting some kind of uh stasis or just laying down being lazy rather than uh getting out of your own way so you can do more effortlessly so i i was thinking how you think about that term and maybe if non-forcing or even non-trying could be more uh more accurate yeah this is a, this is an interesting one and i i have the default is to using the term non-doing because that's the most common translation of Wu Wei. Um, but I, I do, I like non-forcing. Um, it does, I think it does capture more accurately what's about. But at the same time, I, I like non-doing because it doesn't let people off the hook so much. So right. a lot of this experience is extremely subtle and you have to be, you have to point it out to you a lot that you're actually doing something when you don't think you're doing. So if I were to tell people, you know, stop forcing. Now just say, yeah, I'm not forcing. It's fine. Look, I'm not forcing it. Um, when they are, they just don't realize it. So if you go straight in and be non-doing, it kind of introduces a bit of a paradox in people's minds. They kind of go like, oh, um, what does that even mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, so to non-do, how can I, how can I walk down the street and not be doing it? And that's that's the point, right? So so doing, trying, and forcing are kind of a synonym at that point. Where if you are consciously coordinating yourself. And doing walking rather than just wanting to be somewhere and letting it happen, then yeah. that's the kind of interference that I'm talking about. And yeah, forcing is just a stronger word for it. Later. Right. So okay. So the so, so the uh, the doing part is uh, meant to. Um, I'm completely blanking on the word here. I guess I'm trying trying too hard, but uh, yeah, it's it's meant for for consciously trying to do something. Yes. And well, yeah. that's where that's where the examples from from what Alan Watts is saying about kind of now listen. What do you do when, when a teacher yells at you to now listen? You, you tense around your eyes and your ears. Um, <laughs> yeah. When a, a teacher yells at you to pay attention, you you know you straighten up and you, you tighten muscle. And none of that has anything to do with with thinking or paying attention. But yeah. we forget that. So what what tends to happen? What what happens to everyone unless you, you know, grow up in a cave and you're influenced by these things? Um, is that the part <laughs> of you? The part of you that thinks, um, that has what might feel like free will, takes over in doing things that it's not particularly well equipped to do. So a good example of this is, you know, you're at, you're at school and at some point you, you know, you're walking normally and then suddenly you get the idea of what cool is and you start to think, oh, I'll walk in a cool way. Right? <laughs> or I'll, I'll, I'll put on I these affectations and I kind of just, you right, exactly. You start to kind of, oh, I've been told I should have good posture and I've noticed that my shoulders are down. So, okay, I'll, I'll try and do what everyone else does and kind of pull myself up. And at that point, you're done for because yeah, any yeah. amount of pushing yourself up and down, whatever, is is not what you had in the first place. Um, so what you need to do is let that thing out of the way. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, it's a counterintuitive concept. And I remember uh, I got a lot of memories now when you were talking about this, about, um, for instance, I, I remember I used to skateboard when I was younger. And... Uh, I used to skateboard to our grocery store and every time there were 
cool kids hanging outside the grocery store and I, I, I would have to um, perform a trick. I would have to uh, tell myself that, oh, you need to really succeed this time. So I was all in my head and I was really trying to uh, control the situation and it never worked, of course. And then every right. time where nobody was, uh, was watching at all and you were just having a f- fun time and you didn't think about it, then it worked. And uh, it's... Um, it's a really cool phenomenon. But but so I think I've experienced this in a prolonged way only only once in my adult lifetime. And it was when I was uh, hiking in the forest with a friend of mine and we decided that, hey, let's try to walk together in silence for the next four hours or so. And the initial 30 minutes are kind of awkward and the chatter is going on in the head and it's, uh, oh, we should be talking. Is he thinking this is weird? And but then eventually that kind of died out and I remember just effortlessly moving through the forest and we were climbing trees and hiking up mountains and it was just, I, I didn't feel like I was controlling any of that and yet my body did that perfectly well. And th- the thing I, that was most uh, stood out most to me was when we were getting out of the forest and we decided again to start talking and the chatter just instantly pop back on and I just remember that contraction uh, again of awareness and uh, the feeling, the illusion of control again and that kind of neurotic uh, vibe that accompanies that. Uh, it was really, uh, really cool. Uh, so I, I would like to explore a concept that I think you, you're you using as well, the, the, the idea of the body-mind. Mm-hmm. So yep. uh, as far as I understand it, it's that that yeah, the body and the mind, these things are not, you, you can't clearly separate them. And uh, muscular tension basically is the same as mind tension. So, uh, yeah, could you explicate that a little bit? Yeah, of course. So, so Alexander didn't use the term body-mind. I think he may have done it a couple of times, but he used the term psychophysical unity. So the idea right. that there's no such thing. That's <laughs> enough, isn't it? He wasn't a great writer, yeah. to be honest. Um, okay. I was reading one of his books and I found a hundred word sentence with one comma. Um, so it's uh, pretty tough reading. <laughs> oh, <it's great. laughs> um, but yeah, he used the term psychophysical unity and basically that means there's no such thing as a purely mental action and there's no such thing as a purely physical action. So it's all one process. So what we find in, in lessons is we tend to go in through the, the, the physical um, because that's a great way in. Um, and we'll you know, notice tension somewhere as a teacher and then invite lengthening, loosening, whatever it is, kind of release of that tension, that pattern of tension. And that's associated often with a, a mental shift at the same time. So it's, it's not just a, a kind of a therapy, it's not massage. If I'm working with someone, they need to be fully switched on and doing this expanded awareness and non-interference thing for anything to work. And then by working with their bodies, I'm as much working with their, their mind and their, their modes of being and their, their patterns of their habits and all that kind of thing. So it really is, it becomes very obvious very quickly that it's not thing as just a body and just a mind, it's one one system. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, that makes me curious then. What is the, maybe this is hard to answer, but do you have a, an average client? What what are the people that, that usually come to you uh, to work with this? Sure, so I just, I just trust you again that I don't have my own practice, so I work through a school and I, I help uh, I help out there. Um, the people who come in for tra- training to be teachers and who come in um, as, as guests and they're not training, they tend to be a couple of camps. One is traditional kind of lower back pain, neck pain, kind of, and they've heard that Alexander Technique is helpful for that, and it is, but I don't think that's the, the main benefit, but it is a definitely a valuable thing. There are performers, um, and Alexander Technique is very well known, uh, well, mainly known, um, in performance communities, like acting, music, sports, that kind of thing. And they want to improve their performance. And then finally, there's the kind of anxious people or overly thinky people um, <laughs> who want to kind of learn to let go of it. Um, yeah. And most people I, I work with um, or you know, have kind of coalesced around the school that I'm, I'm kind of affiliated with um, tend to be more on the kind of the, the thinky personal transformation side of it. Yeah. No, I feel like I would fit into both one and three out of those. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to learn more about this. But so how um, we we mentioned Superman in the beginning, and that was intentional because you've written a great article 
called How to Be Superman. And in the article, you start by showing a video um, of uh, an old Superman movie where the uh, the actor playing Superman starts out the scene as Clark Kent and he's not really hunched over, but he you, you can see he's contracted and he's making himself a little smaller than he needs to be. Uh, he looks a little forced and he has his glasses on and he's talking to Louis Lane or whoever it is. And then she leaves the room and he takes off his glasses and kind of transforms into Superman. I, I'll link to the video in the uh, podcast show notes, but he flows up into this effortless posture and... um you you oftentimes you hear about how AT can improve posture as one thing. So can you talk a little more about this article and and, and uh, what I just described here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love I love that clip of Superman. It's one of my favorite clips in all of cinema. I think probably because it illustrates this point so well. Um, you know, you see him you see him holding himself down and being and doing things to be Clark Kent. And then what's magical, and you see him floating up, but if you look really closely, or at least if I look really closely, I can see the moment when he swaps from being Clark and Superman, and he's barely changed anything. He hasn't started going up yet. He's mm. just, he's, something has changed, and then his body reconfigures to the new Superman state. So he makes the change first, and then then the floating up and the good positive happens after that. So what's yeah. happening there is that he's compressing, he's compressing his spatial awareness forward and down. So he's he's not aware of the room, right? He's looking towards Lois in front of him. He's kind of, he's just shrunken and his body reflects that. But Superman is like this wide open, fully confident in like, being in the entire space. And then his mm. body expands to reflect that. He's kind of like a, a martial artist who's just aware of everything all at once um, and isn't kind of privileging anything in, in any direction. It's just kind of, whatever will happen will happen kind of state of being. And it's just that his body reflects that. That's so that's why the posture is a wonderful benefit. For me, it's a, it's a consequence of and not the point of. I don't know. When I read this and when I heard you talk about, um, yeah, the idea that bad posture is, is something you're doing rather than the other way around, which seems to be the more intuitive point that if you want to have a good posture, you have to effort... F- uh, you have to put in effort muscularly to consciously think about, yeah, I had to be straighten my neck and my, my upper back and shoulders back and so on. That's what I've learned. And since I've struggled a lot with neck and, and back pain and stuff like that, I'm very, very conscious of what I presume to be my good posture. And so my, my, uh, my pushback here would be that when I'm sitting here right now and I'm talking to you, I'm consciously thinking of sitting up straight. And I feel like if I actually relax right now, I look like the hunchback from Notre Dame when I relax. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so can you can you uh, uh, exercise my doubts here? What am I getting wrong here? So what's happening there is that you're conflating relaxing with effortlessness. So you're doing you're doing what it looks like to be relaxed. If you like. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so. I mean, what I would say here is that you don't know what good posture is. Like your conscious thinking mind doesn't know where your shoulders, head, back, hips, all that stuff should be. And that's why when we start trying to interfere, we kind of like, okay, if I just pull my shoulders up, if I just push this back, you know, it, it gets very silly very quickly and just leads to more pain. Um, and your, your collapsing there is the kind of thing that I would tell someone off for nicely in a lesson, I don't, you kind of checked out. That's actually a diminishing of consciousness. If you if you pay attention to that, you'll notice that when you relax in the way that you're describing, your your spatial awareness is more limited, it's more narrow, and you're kind of switching off the natural functioning of your system. And that's why when you go into the expanded state and then allow your body to to do what it needs to do, then you'll find an easier route into that that more natural poise. Now, one of the issues here is that. In a lesson, I might, um, we, I normally work, mostly just work by kind of working hands on, on the head first. There's a relationship between the, the skull and the spine. That if you right. make some adjustment there, the rest of the system turns on, so to speak. But even then, if I've, you know, if the spine, if the spine and the head are in the right relationship, you might still find that, that someone's pushing their pelvis forwards because the, the habits are quite strong. 
and then you didn't you kind of interrupt that pattern and, and slowly show someone all the things that they're, they're doing that they could stop doing. So even if you were to expand your awareness in that what I would call a collapsed or relaxed state, it doesn't necessarily mean that your system will fix itself because you have a lot of habits of years, you know, lots of years worth of stuff to undo. So that's why I work yeah. as a teacher or kind of having someone pointing out you're still doing this and you're still doing that, you know, don't do that kind of approach um, is is very helpful. So you're kind of like a physiotherapist slash mas- uh, meditation guru in one. Uh, I, hmm. <laughs> I'm closer to meditation. I, I'm struggling with the physiotherapy angle of it only yeah, because okay. it's, it's not about building any particular muscles or strengthening this versus that. It's about seeing that, okay, what you're doing right now is you are holding tension in this muscle and you don't know how to stop it. You don't even know that you're doing it. You don't have to stop it. And I'm going to show you how to stop it. And the only way you're going to stop it is by not trying to. And that's where people kind of go, huh, okay, there's something else here. And that opens up interesting avenues for exploration. Hmm. Well, okay, I get, I get very curious now when you say that you adjust the head and the spine there, hands yep. on. But is there any, um, have you figured out any way to allude to this adjustment only through words, like through this medium? Is there something we can try? Yeah, so it, it's funny, actually. The, the experience of doing it in lessons and on the awareness thing is really interesting to, to highlight that in an in-person lesson, you'd use your hands because it's the, the most direct and accessible way of doing it, and then the awareness right. thing follows. What I've been doing online is starting with the awareness and then allowing for the body to follow. And for, for me, I'm, I'm not aiming at improving people's posture by video that's really the hardest thing to do because yeah. there's a lot of kind of habits what i have found is that people have said like you know after our session i found myself standing more lightly for some reason and i don't understand why that's fine that's awesome cool but i wouldn't aim at that so one of the ways that i've been playing with showing people the kind of expanded awareness that i'm talking about is to run through a little little game um, I, it could be absolutely anything, but just something that hijacks your, your thinking mind, essentially. Um, and the one I usually use is a variation of don't think of an elephant, basically, mm-hmm. which is by asking someone, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to identify an object you can pick up. And then I pause, and I ask the person, are you already looking for an object you can pick up? Is part of your brain already off looking for something? Even though I said, in a minute. Right. We're not right. even there yet. <laughs> and yeah. part of your brain is just like off, gone, looking. And in that moment, you might realize that your awareness of the room and the space around you went away a little bit. Right. So that's a way of showing that this expanded awareness thing exists. And now what I would teach is, or well, okay, how do you how do you stop that? So let's say you know you don't want to think of an object, you want to actively stop. So I'll run it with you and, and anyone can play along at home. So this time I want you to actively try not to pick an object, right? Do whatever you need to do to try not to pick an object. So we'll go again. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to identify an object you can pick up. I'll pause for effect. (laughs) (laughs) So what, what happened? What did you experience? Uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm, I have so much hay fever today that I'm, my mind is <laughs> kind of <laughs> blank anyway, but I was just staring at a word in my, sh- in my notes here and, uh, mm-hmm. trying to just zone out on that word basically. Yeah. So yeah. And that's another common response. So when your attention is hijacked and you don't think of an elephant, one way that you commonly do it is to literally think of anything else and kind of yeah. over-focus on something to push away this thought. Right. And, you know, that, that works at a surface level, but you're still, your experiences are defined by the thing you're trying not to do, in a sense, right? You're still, you're not in control of yourself. You're still kind of fighting in a way. Mm. So what I would suggest instead is to, first of all, notice non-judgmentally, and that's crucial, that your awareness has been hijacked a little bit, so you're, you're, you're collapsed in on the idea of looking for an object or making an elephant. And then rather than either engaging with that thought or fighting it, so neither engage nor fight, instead choose to just become aware of the space around you instead. 
And a couple of ways into that might be, you know, imagine that there's an aircraft miles above your head. Just check in that you could hear it if it were possible to hear it. And even even that idea of like there's something above you that you might be able to hear if you listen for it is enough to switch on even a small sense of that kind of awareness thing and give you a little bit of room to breathe in your awareness, so to speak. Yeah. So if you want, we can we can wait one more time. And if you're hated with permits, it to work. Um, <laughs> so this time, just, just, just notice what I described, that this, this doing process kicks in. And then mm-hmm. instead of engaging, just, you know, become aware of the fact you're in a room, you can hear sounds, there's textures, colors, whatever around you that you can also be aware of all at once. So you're not moving from kind of spotlight to spotlight, but it's all a kind of wide open, unfiltered experience. Right, yeah, I got so, it. So last time, last time, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to identify an object you can pick up. And now in this moment, I'll point out that many people kind of forget that there's space behind them. So I'll mm. encourage you to remember that that's there as well. Because we can see forward and down, we can't see up and behind. Yeah, yeah. Sound is a very helpful thing for me. Sound. I hear my wife yeah, exactly. in, the, yeah, in the back. Yeah, so you can see, so you know, we, we can see forward and down, so you know, it's hard to visualize behind, but if you just like, let, let, let it occur to you that there might be a sound behind you, so to speak, yeah. then that kind of gives you the kind of effect I'm looking for. That's really, really cool. And I, um, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking... <laughs> You, you, you're saying that the, the main benefit is uh, most of the things, or maybe not most, but very many of the things that we do during a day uh, is better done without this conscious uh, interference, this conscious stumbling over yourself practically. And so instead of using our, our conscious ability to reason to add to what we can do well already unconsciously, we're, we're kind of getting in our own ways. Yeah, my question becomes, is it always better to be in expanded awareness or are there times where contracted awareness might actually be useful or even needed? It's an interesting question. It's, it's a good question. And I guess my first comment is that I'm not anti-rationality. I'm not anti-thinking. <laughs> um, and that's why I'm very quick to say, you know, I did physics at university. I work in consulting. I use my yeah. brain a lot. I, lo- I, you know, I use spreadsheets. Um, and... <laughs> What I'm, what I am saying though is that that part of the brain, that process, that tool that we have might not be suited to doing everything, right? Imagine if you try to beat your heart or to function your spleen, like it just wouldn't work. But that's kind of what's happened in other domains, such as breathing, walking, sitting, whatever. And yeah, it's a good analogy. it does extend, it, it does extend as well to, uh, I say, knowledge work. And productivity and all that kind of stuff as well. It's just that it's more obvious with stuff like posture. But the the sense of layering on more effort than is required because you think you have to or you don't realize that you're doing it often leads to worse outcomes. And in fact, if you were to loosen the grip of that thing over yourself, what you find in many cases is that you perform to a much higher standard with much less effort. In fact, this is where cool thing comes from. You know, if you're trying to be cool, you're not cool. By that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? and, yeah. and the way to be cool is by not trying to be cool. Well, how yeah, do you do exactly. that? Right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have one more question there. One more question was around, is it okay, so should you always be expanded? Yeah, is it always superior? This is a funny one. So I'm, I will say that I'm, nev- I'm not always expanded. Um, I have plenty of habits that, that kind of compress, that collapse my awareness down. What I often say to people is, just try it. So you might think, oh, okay, well, you know, I can see it when I'm dancing or when I'm skiing or whatever, but surely not when I'm reading because I have to focus, right? And I'll just say, okay, well, cool, maybe. Why don't you try it? And then with the reading example, someone might say, oh, well, actually, I found that I was kind of, I found my one going out into the book and trying to bring the words to my face, and that was weird. And if I just expanded out my awareness, that the words just kind of came in. In the same way as Alan Watts says, you know, you don't need to try to understand what I'm saying right now. And I can, yeah. I can say some nonsense. It's just I'm speaking English. If you speak English, you're not, you don't need to make any effort to understand these words. It just happens by itself. And yet very often we do find ourselves kind of trying to understand. And that yeah. trying to understand is interference. 
Yeah, but it, it's so, um, I mean, scary, for lack of a better word, to... Um, it feels like if if you're not, and I'm speaking for myself, but I, I imagine other people can relate to this. It feels like the second I let go of this obsessive uh, conscious control, quote unquote, everything will go to shit. There, 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 there's an well, element of trust needed here. Uh, absolutely. Trust, yeah, trust and, and letting go to be a little cheesy, but, but there's truth to that. Well, let me ask you, when you had your experience walking around the woods, did anything about happening? Um, no, I mean, we, we, we yelled a bit and threw some rocks. That was a weird face of my life. But no, <laughs> not that I know of. Right. So I'm guessing that in that moment, you, you weren't unconscious. You weren't gone off somewhere. In fact, you were probably more conscious than you were other times. You were yeah. present. You were there. You know, there wasn't the sense of you know, ego, ego death. Ego dissolution isn't a sense of like, oh, I'm, I'm now checked out. Right, you're still a conscious awareness acting in the world. And yeah. that's where intention comes in is very important. So let's say that I'm expanded and I'm kind of allowing this non doing process to happen. I can still intend I want to walk over there. I want to walk over here. I want to talk to this person. I want to say things. I'm just not layering on the additional I mean, these were nonsense that we do. Yeah. <laughs> that we don't that we don't need to be doing this extra effort. And that, that's where that's where trust does come in. So you know, you had experiences of the way like you're playing sports or you're talking or whatever, and yeah. you don't know the words that come out of your mouth next. Right? And you can get totally screwed up in social situations by trying to plan every single word and every joke. And this is a thing in improv, right? If you, if you go out on the stage with a joke prepared and then you get there in five seconds and the scene's moved on, but you try and make the old joke that falls flat, you have yeah, to be yeah, responsive yeah. in the moment, right? And that's what this is. You're not going to go there and, and start punching your, your colleagues on the improv stage. <laughs> but you are gonna you are gonna fit in with the scene because you have that intention. You're in conscious control. Yeah. No. I mean, uh, I I, uh, I tweeted a quote from Alan Watts uh, the other day uh, where he said, "Wu Wei is the art of sailing rather than rowing through life." <laughs> and I yeah. thought that was so great. And uh, yeah, you yeah can we put it, where you want to go. Yeah, we put in so much effort where where we don't have to, which is. Um, it's very interesting, and I'm I'm wondering that I'm I'm just going to push back a little here because it's more fun okay. to do so. So, one thing that that I instinctively think of uh, when we talk about contracted awareness, in the context of contracted awareness, uh, maybe being even better or more useful in certain contexts, is the uh, the concept of flow. Mm-hmm. And so, when I'm the the times I can remember uh, where I've been in flow are times where I'm, maybe I'm lost in a conversation with someone, uh, someone interesting like yourself, and I'm just really into the ideas and the words, and all of a sudden, three hours have gone by, and, and somebody interrupts us, and I all of a sudden I feel like, oh shit, I need to pee so bad, I'm going to explode. And I, I'm so hungry, and oh, my phone has been buzzing for two hours. And I, I, I feel like there's something inherently nice in that, and so I'm curious then if you're if you're saying that that could have been uh, experienced uh, ex- in a, in a, yeah some sort of expanded flow instead where I wouldn't lose anything that I gained from that but I would gain something additional. Yeah, what's your thought on that? Yeah, so I know what you mean. Um, yeah. <laughs> partic- particularly in knowledge work where you know, we go off into our computers for hours and do the coding thing or whatever it is. Um, yeah, yeah. Do the writing thing. That does tend to come with it, a sense of, kind of zoning out and pushing the world away. And then you, you, know, you find yourself hunched over and many times, you know, you, you kind of, that's when you <laughs> notice after six hours that your back hurts, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, perhaps there was a part of you that kind of checked out and wasn't, <laughs> wasn't looking after your body at the same time. Um, and I would say people who have that experience or who have that experience is that, okay, I'm not saying you can't have that. What I am saying is that perhaps this, this expanded awareness thing might be a different axis to flow versus not flow. So I'm, I'm imagining a two by two because, you know, consultant, um, you can have you know, expanded flow, um, which I would say would be like a, a football player on the field, right? You've got team members all over the place. Uh, you've got the ball, you've got your position. You know, you're, you're definitely, that, that person is in flow. 
right? They're, they're definitely into it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, their expand, their, their awareness is wide open. Or like the martial artists I mentioned earlier, who, you know, in my teacher use advantage all the time. Um, they might have opponents on, on all four sides or three sides, but they don't know which one will attack first. And if they prepare, if they get ready in any direction, the other one behind that one, the other one will, will punch them. So they have to just kind of sit there in an available state. Yeah. Wide open and, and, and spontaneous. But at the same time, I can say again, you know, they're definitely on flow. Right? They're, they're fully focused on not getting killed <laughs> or beaten yeah. up. Um, <laughs> yeah. So those two examples might, might highlight that you can have a kind of flow. And for the other end, for the kind of the, for the narrow flow or for the, the coding style, for people who are kind of curious about this, I would say, well, just have a go. Right? So you, you can expand. Just be, I'm not saying that you have to listen out for other sounds in the room or be distracted by your colleagues talking, but just kind of having a module in your brain that reminds you there's space behind you mm -hmm. is, and above you, is enough in many cases to kind of let go of that grip of the doer. So let me back up there. So the flow state that many of us feel in the coding style is, is in many ways a forcing. It's kind of like a, like a, we uh, must code faster. Like it's, it's not always, you kind of absorb, but it's not always pleasant. Yeah, it's tiring. Um, so you finish it and you're like, you're exhausted and you hurt. So you can I, I, play I, with expanding out of it. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but I, I would actually yeah, push it, back it, on that because I think the, um, the definition of the term is that it is effortless and that it is enjoyable inherently. And that mm -hmm. I, at least when I'm, uh, for instance, uh, let's say playing a video game or, or something else like that. I always feel energized by the end of it. So I yeah. think that is, is n maybe not an accurate representation of the flow that I'm, I'm talking about. No, that's fair. I guess I'm being, I'm, I'm, I'm being harsh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I think you have a great point there. And I think in, in many cases, b being more expansive, uh, allows you to more, freely choose between all the available options. And uh, there might be an argument for why it's not good to wait three hours to empty your full bladder. Uh, it might right. <laughs> even damage you or you, maybe you urinate yourself, you know? So, well, yeah. I mean, that's what it comes down to. It comes down to choice, like you were saying. Like, if you have the yeah. choice, if you're in that flow state and you, you, you are not aware enough of your bladder to go and use the bathroom if you wanted to, that's an issue, right? That's really not helpful. If you're sat there going like, oh, in each moment I have a choice, I can either stay here or get up and go to the bathroom, cool, yeah, yeah, you yeah. can keep choosing, you can keep choosing to, to do a, play the game or whatever. In the same way as earlier on, like you have a choice to pick an object to pick up if you want to, but you're not yeah. like, totally gripped and like hijacked by the idea of it. So it gives you more conscious choice. Yeah, so, so you can say you, you, you use the expanded awareness to choose among your options and then... Uh, I would say intermittently you contract to perform them because I would say even in your examples of let's say the martial artist or the uh, the football player, uh, whilst I would grant you that uh, they need an expansive awareness to be aware of, of all the factors at play, I would say that at certain points in the game uh, for football, you have to to be able to uh, to perform uh, maybe a, a very difficult uh, maneuver to get past a single player, maybe you actually have to contract very quickly to put all your effort into that and then instantly expand again to look at your options once more. Something like that, I would I could imagine. Yes, and I, I should be clear here that I'm given the the dominance of of the doing and collapsed mindset, shall we say that I'm. I'm probably unfairly picking on the collapsed awareness just to kind of make the point. <laughs> but what, what this is really about is not being expanded all the time. It's about yeah. having the, the conscious control around whether you are collapsed or narrow, shall we say, but a fairer, a nicer word than, than collapsed. A, a narrowed awareness or a wide awareness. So the trick is, okay, notice, you might want to be like open most of the time, or like expanded most of the time, but you, you, it's not ideal to be hijacked by whatever happens, whether it's the impulse to sit down or someone throwing a wall at you. You want to be able to say, no, for this situation, I want to stay up, like, expanded. And I want to be able to, be able to have that, that power over myself rather than letting myself be pushed around by, the, by circumstances, essentially. No, that makes sense. All right, folks, time for the fun stuff. 
If you enjoy my podcast and you want to support it, you can now become a monthly Patreon supporter at patreon.com slash doexplain. Or if you'd rather make a one-time donation, you can visit ko-fi.com slash doexplain instead. That is ko-fi.com slash doexplain. Perhaps ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And surely, Jesus would donate to uh, do explain. Another way to make the podcast grow and improve is to tell people you know who you think would enjoy it to check it out. Because with more support and exposure, I'll be able to improve the podcast continually and produce more content, which is something that I would love to do. Lastly, thank you so much to all of you who've donated so far. It truly means the world to me, and I want to extend my gratitude. Back to enjoying the show. It's it's interesting because uh, I'm not uh, sure how aware you are of uh, the epistemological theme that runs through this podcast, but the, uh, the the this ties very nicely into the principles of non-coercion that we espouse within uh, the Popperian epistemology, where um, yeah, you can't grant authority to any one idea, whether it's a conscious idea in words or in explicit ideas like feelings or sensations. And uh, you need to take them all into account. They're all guesswork and they all have something to convey. And uh, it sounds like this goes perfectly hand in hand with this and might even be the uh, the way to describe this, this subjective exper- experience of actually being non-coercive in the way you make choices in your life. So I uh, I really like that. That's not very similar, and I think I'm my, one of my next steps will be to explore that um, that way of thinking that you're talking about, which I'm not so familiar with. Um, so, any recommendations for where to start? Please let me know. Um, Absolutely. But just in a kind of in a kind of like lesson context, um, one of the ways that we might point out to someone who's just standing there, and they're kind of you can see that they're narrow, you can see that they kind of hold themselves, and they're not really in the world; they're they're kind of checked out in a way. Um, it's just by saying, you know, check that you can go anywhere. Because if your awareness is constrained to the space in front of you, you can only step into the space in front of you. Like anything outside of that is outside of your, your conscious choice. But by oh, yeah. checking that you can go anywhere, oh yeah, I can go to the other room, I can go behind me, I can dance, I can whatever. It opens up a much wider possibility space. And you're not hooked by any individual option. Instead, all options are there and you can kind of play in that space. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. So uh, a question that arose now was the idea that because uh, we were talking about in, in posture terms we're, or, or habits in general, we learn all these bad habits that we then have to unlearn. So at this moment, when you ask me to notice the space behind me or the space above me or preferably both, I feel like I have to do that. I feel like I have to consciously work on that because it goes against what I'm used to doing. So is this something that uh, I take it to be the result of just having developed all these bad habits? But once I unlearn these bad habits, this is, I don't like the word word natural, but, but I guess this would be the natural state. Is this how kids see the world, you would argue, and, and how we we are uh, kind of meant to to see the world, uh, as it were. I mean, I think this is more like how kids experience the world and how, say, cats experience the world. I think it's probably when you don't have the uh, the verbal layering on top. Um, I don't know about natural either necessarily. Um, yeah. And in fact, what we're talking about here is not regressing to a you know like like kids like cats, but it's kind of we can be human and have access to all those tools and then go to the next step beyond that, which is, and also have what kids have, that kind of spatial awareness thing, which is the same thing that Harding talks about in on Having No Head. He has the, the framework at the back of different arrows pointing in, I've forgotten the exact details, but it's kind of an evolution, right? So that you have to kind of have the fall of going into um, habitual thinking, rational overload mode, and then you can yeah. learn to control that you can learn to harness that um and you have access to it and to other stuff as well but it's in context and it's in proportion it's not dominating and just controlling your experience the worst thing yeah. is when when that thing when you see through that part of your brain and you believe that's it and that's the only way of seeing 
this is a way of saying, okay, that's useful, but there's, it's just it's other stuff as well. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I remember you, uh, you had a nice example last time we spoke um, in evolutionary terms why expanded awareness must have been oh, yeah. a, a benefit or even a necessity, perhaps. Maybe you can uh, give that example. Yeah, for sure. So this is an example that my, my teacher uses all the time, which I think is very helpful. Um, and I know very little, unfortunately, about early man, but that's the same for the sake of argument that <laughs> there, was a, there was a savannah involved. Um, and in this place, that there were threats in the forms of scorpions and eagles um, overhead. Now, at any moment, you could be attacked by, you could be like harmed by either a scorpion or an eagle, but you don't, no, you don't see me right now. But if you go off looking up for eagles and cut out the ground, if you like, from your awareness, you're also susceptible to being stung by a scorpion and vice versa. If you just look at the ground and ignore the sky, you'll miss the eagle coming down and swooping at you. So what you're saying is that... Happens to um, me all the time. <laughs> exactly. You never know an eagle might strike in. Um, <laughs> so it's, a, it's the same as that martial artist, right? You have to be available to be spontaneous to what happens, which is the same thing as, I think, Alan Watts describes an awful lot in, in Zen training. At any moment, the, the master might jump out with a stick and hit you. Yeah. You, <laughs> you, can't get, you can't get ready for it. If you get ready for it, he'll still catch you out. The only way for you to, feel, to, to miss that stick is for you to just be fully spontaneous in the moment. And that's what this is about. Yeah, I love that. And it's so counterintuitive that you, the, the way, um, yeah, if, if you want to be spontaneous, you can't, can't want to be spontaneous almost, or you can't try. Yeah, exactly. It's such a, exactly. such a ironic bind uh, that the universe well, this puts is, us this in. Is actually, this is really important because it's a, it's a fundamental part of the training. Um, that you find yourself in a trap over and over and over again because the the part of the brain that like you, you basically it's like not that koan training or whatever you kind of you shock that part of your brain off for a second and then you experience the world directly shall I put it that way but then that part of your brain that got conned if you like tries to figure <laughs> out what happened and then it tries to do it so in one yeah. week I might say to someone okay well think of the place above you and that's enough to kind of turn that thing off. But then the next week, I'll give them the same prompt and they'll say like, they'll kind of go looking for it. They'll start thinking about the space problem rather than directly being aware of it. And that's that's just another kind of trying. It's the same process. So you need different tricks over time to show people that, no, it's, it's, not, it's not one trick. It's not one path into it. It's the letting go of all the paths you think it is. So that's, yeah. that's that level of matter. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, so I have a, um, a few more questions that I want to ask you before I thought we could go to Twitter questions. Uh, because <laughs> sure. we got quite a few. So, yes. uh, yeah, when it comes to suffering and uh, neurosis and emotional pain, do you think there is a direct link here between expansion contraction and suffering uh namely is, is it possible to suffer when you're fully expanded or is all suffering in some sense tied to contraction oh that's a good question <laughs> um so one one thing i would say is that suffering or pain definitely causes contraction and i i, I did a video on this a while ago wasn't my first one of Chronic pain is something that causes your attention, your awareness to collapse onto the pain. So your entire world is the pain, if you like. And you can you can do what you, you experienced earlier with the, the picking an object exercise. You can either go into it and just your entire experience is suffering, or you can yeah. try and push it away by over-focusing on something else. You're still defined by pain either way. Instead, yeah. what you can do again is expand out that you, you kind of leave the pain alone, leave the suffering there, but it's in relation to a much bigger space. So where the where the pain stays the same size, so to speak, it's a much smaller proportion of the overall universe that you're inhabiting at the time. So you're you're still honouring it; it's still there. You're either pushing it away, but you're neither letting it dominate you. Um, so it's just a different relationship with pain and suffering. Yeah, because in my in my vocabulary, I I differentiate between pain and suffering. I mean, definitions of words are, are, are conventional and doesn't really matter that much. But so so I think of pain uh, 
you can have pain as I have right now in my back. I don't feel like I'm suffering the pain. Mm. Suffering in the way I use it is when you construct a conceptual framework around it, a narrative for why it's bad, why I wish it wasn't oh, yeah. there. I, I shouldn't be suffering. Really. Yeah. Will I ever get better? What if I can never lift like this again or whatever? And um, that seems to be heavily tied to contraction. It feels yeah. like whenever you take one, because inherent in uh, suffering then from, from such a narrative around uh, pain, to keep using that example, is that you believe whatever is being said there and you're not allowing objections to come in, alternative explanations to enter awareness, which to me feels like a contraction. Like dogmatism is a form of contracting around certain beliefs. Yeah. Um, and uh, But this is something I think is very, very interesting. And I think that ties nicely into contraction in the physical sense that we mentioned before, the body-mind principles. I feel like it all comes together in a very nice way here. It, it does, yeah. And there's something in there around... The suffering is caused by some kind of belief around the suffering. Uh, let's say the pain and the suffering. The suffering is, I shouldn't be feeling pain. I, it's not fair. Blah, 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 right? And you kind of, you stay there. Now, yeah. which, what part of you is it that's saying, or any kind of judgment, I shouldn't, I, I don't like this, all of that stuff. It'll get kind of the Buddhist view here as well. It's the same part of your, your mind that does things that I was talking about earlier. It's the wordy, thinky, rational, interfering part. So if you're identified right. with the thinker, then of course you'll suffer because it, it wants to stay there. So a way out of that is to just be, which happens to feel like under the awareness and you can play with that. But if mm. you let go of the grip of the thinking, the judge, you might call it, then suffering turns back into pain. And pain is an experience. It's just a thing it feels like. Suffering is laid on by judgment. Yeah, absolutely. But then again, I think that... Um, there are, because I think there's a danger here when people talk in this way where all value judgments all of, this, all of a sudden becomes uh, mistakes. Uh, because th th there is a point where, let's say I put my, my foot into a sea of pariahs who start biting my foot. I can I release judgment and see through the ego as I do, yeah, commonly. And... Uh, and and I can I can do that, and I can probably get to a point where I don't suffer, and I just feel the pain. But that's a dumb thing to do. And so uh, what we're saying here, or at least uh, I don't take you to say that this is the thing we should be doing, but it's more the idea that 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 we have to question all those judgments, and most of them are are probably bullshit. And uh, yeah, a result of of not enough expansion and awareness of the alternatives to those. Uh, beliefs or judgments mm. there's a couple of things in there and yeah I'm, I'm not saying you should leave your foot to be eaten by rabbit piranhas <laughs> so, <laughs> you shouldn't always come to terms with that but in that okay, moment I'm glad we're on the same page no we're definitely read on that don't worry I, I, I don't want to do that either um, in that moment <laughs> you, you'll, you'll feel the pain and then you know the, the response should be to get your foot out of the, the water right and then, you know, suffer the suffering comes in when you're thinking, no, I should be here. It's, it's right that I leave my foot in and endure this pain. That's, <laughs> that's another layer of rationalization of not just getting your foot out of the water. Right? So what I'm saying here is you still have perfectly full conscious control and you can see more of what is true or not. You can see, oh, look, I have my foot in a bowl of piranhas. That's dumb. I should take it out, shouldn't I? <laughs> Rather than, oh, woe is me, my foot hurts so much, but it's good because, you know, I'm just going to separate out my suffering from my pain of turning off the thing at night. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's so fully conscious. All this yeah. is is a tool for letting go of the thinker once it's told you something useful, which is getting your foot out of the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, uh, yeah, I thought we could, maybe we could... Um, talk a little more about some practical tips and tricks uh -huh. perhaps before we move to Twitter questions. So I, um, I personally love practice because I want to hear how you recommend that people start practicing this. If there are certain protocols, certain times of day, certain activities that are very conducive to this. And for myself, uh, I love taking walks 
and and trying to do this? Is there something, for instance, when 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 you're walking that you can pay attention to in a way that's uh, you can do that every time you 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 walk on your lunch break or something? Yeah, it's a good question, and I would not recommend stuff like meditation practice where you sit there for an hour and do it. It's not a thing that you compartmentalize. It's always a thing that you you have going on in activity. Yeah, and I think walking is the best one that I found. Um, so let's say you go for a walk at lunch, um, and let's say it's a nice park, so you can kind of enjoy being in nature. First of all, I'd say turn off any kind of podcasting or looking at your phone while you're walking and stuff. And your 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 goal, if you like, the thing that you're working with is just noticing what you notice. So pay attention to the present moment. And then the, the thing I would layer on here is don't try to, like, okay, now I'm looking at a bird, now a plant, now a whatever is notice the habit that you have of going to narrow on things. Notice how the spotlight moves from thing to thing. And that's what you're aware of. Instead, expand out and listen for all the sounds all at once. Notice mm. all the colors all at once, right? And just notice the back and forth of expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. And if you notice a contraction, just choose, okay, well, I'm over focusing this plant now. Let's listen for that bird again at the same time. And I can still look at the bird. I can still look at the, the plant in front of me while also hearing that bird behind me. So it's that kind of both hand, if I use, may use the phrase, both yeah. hand thing rather than either or um, attention thing. But so in general, it seems like the think, expand up and be aware of what's behind you. Those two are good yes. trigger points for this this experience. I, yes, absolutely. So, you know, always always check in throughout the day. Like, am I aware of the space above me? And behind me, in the same sense as I said, you know, kind of when you leave your phone on Twitter scrolling, something you come aware of the room. It's not thinking about the space around you. It's suddenly just like suddenly bang, there it is. Right? That's the experience we're looking for. But it's so easy to fall into the trap of thinking about space and think like I was going for a walk once in the park and I was I thought I was paying attention to the park, to the to nature, but I was actually just like listening to my inner monologue describing it. Right. Yeah. My awareness was, was limited to my thoughts describing the world. And when I saw that, I just saw my thoughts as part of the landscape. And then one of those Kensho experiences happens like okay, everything is just one happened of itself. Um but you can get you can get easily trapped in the kind of you're not realizing you're talking to yourself the whole time. Right, because now, now I got two more questions here that <laughs> popped up. So w- w- one question is when I do the exercise that you did with me before and I, I try to listen to my wife in the other room behind me and think up, uh, this is where I think this is different from Douglas Harding's headless way or Sam Harris way of talking about it because they um, they are talking about collapsing the distance between the seer and the scene. So it's more of a... To me, at least, when I experienced it, maybe I've interpreted it wrong, but it felt like everything became two-dimensional. Uh, whereas this sounds more like... And, and the idea is that there's no center to awareness and there's just consciousness, like a big screen or whatever, uh, a big movie screen. Whereas this, to me, feels like when I think behind me and above me, then I have a reference point that's in the middle. And it feels more like I'm still feeling like I'm me in the middle but I'm uh, aware of a much bigger part of the world around me. Does that make sense? Or am I doing it wrong? No, that, that does make perfect sense. And it is, it's, a, it's a 3D experience, so to speak. So not only does awareness have a kind of an above and behind component, like a spherical, it's, 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 a, it's a size as well. So you can even play with saying, okay, I'm aware of up to the ceiling and I'll go even further up to the sky, up to Mars, whatever. Obviously, like mm-hmm. it gets a bit abstract at that point, but the idea is like <laughs> any any boundaries of your awareness is in a sense a kind of doing. It's a kind of yeah. um, forcing of how things should be um, and limiting what actually is that you're aware of. And that's why the the fact that we see forwards and and down, given our heads are balanced, we look down. I think is a large part of why we we don't experience the world as it is kind of that it comes to us because we're kind of always focused forwards and we cut off above and behind us. So just by bringing in above and behind, you kind of, you're allowing the world to be as it is. 
and you become more mm. responsive to it rather than kind of imposing your own beliefs onto it. Right. Yeah. No, I see what you mean. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, pretend to have an objection, even though I don't. We talk a lot <laughs> on this podcast uh, as well about uh, how everything is, is mo- models of the world. Everything is interpretive. And yeah, I'm just being a stickler for words, but there's no way to directly experience the world as it is. It's all interpretive and something your brain is making up anyway. But I, I completely get what you mean. Uh, so I'm just being okay. a, an asshole here. No, that's actually a really interesting point. <laughs> kind of, it gets into some interesting philosophy at that point. So what I'm talking about is being directly aware of your experience of the world or what exactly, is possible yeah. to experience. I love the idea of the, the you know, is it Douglas Hoffman? No, not him. It's the guy um, who did his head talk about kind of the, the, the world as a, a desktop interface. Um, I've forgotten his name. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, d- but, oh, Douglas you know, Hoffman. I'm, yeah, I think. Hoffman, Hoffman, that's it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I can't argue with that. You know, so I'm not saying that you're perceiving object level reality. What I am saying is that you can be fully present with whatever your interface is. Right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Rather than narrowing on the corner of the desktop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, so lastly, then, this is purely for my own uh, benefit. And, well, the whole podcast is, to be honest. But, but uh, yeah, sleep. I've had sleep issues my whole life, and I know you made a video about this. I'm going to ask you anyway, uh, is there a good way to utilize this uh, to get to sleep easier if you tend to ruminate like I do? Trying to sleep, which gets you in the bind of keeping you awake. That's exactly it. And I guess the first thing I would say, because you know, I, I enjoy sleep hacking, is that first of all, do the obvious stuff like cut out caffeine late and all that kind of stuff. But that aside... This won't this won't fix stimulants, um, but yeah. <laughs> if you are if you're lying in bed and you're trying to fall asleep, then you're kind of in a bind, right? So sleep you don't know how you sleep. You don't your conscious mind has no idea how to switch itself off in the way that sleep happens. And we've all had the experience, you know, you're lying there and it's an important thing. You know, a meeting at eight a.m. is really like very important, and you think, oh, I should go to sleep now, and then you're stuck because you're trying to fall asleep, but you have no idea how. So what you find yourself in is First of all, you can lie there thinking about the meeting, like, oh, yeah, you're planning, you're reviewing, you're brainstorming, whatever. And then, you go, oh, no, I'm keeping myself awake. I should sleep, right? I should, okay, I'll stop that. Let me try and go to sleep. And what you're doing is just you're shifting the same process, part of your brain with different content, but it's still keeping you awake. So it's yeah. just, it's no longer running through planning, but now it's just running through trying to fall asleep. And either way you go, you're keeping yourself awake because that's what's going on. The way out of that trap, is twofold. One is to notice that non-judgmentally. It's like, oh look, I'm doing this, I'm thinking, oh look, I'm there goes that process almost. And then second is to set an intention gently that you want to sleep. So okay, I'm thinking, I want to sleep. Oh look, I'm thinking, I want to sleep. And what you're doing here is you've kind of given instruction to the part of you that does know how to fall asleep. That you want to sleep, mm, right. and then getting up, and then doing your best to get out of the way, right? Because what you might find, and the intention thing here is, is crucial. Because if you're lying there thinking about your meeting or about your day or whatever, you don't actually want to go to sleep. You might, you might, you know, part of you might want to, but another part of you doesn't, doesn't, doesn't definitely doesn't want to go to sleep. You have a conflicting intention there, so of course your your system might not want to do with that. So you want to re- remove that conflict and say, no, I do want to sleep. And I'm going to non-judgmentally unhook from the thinking processes whenever they happen and just trust. That's that's the way into sleep. You can't do it yourself. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. And that's one of the most sad- sadistic uh, binds that nature puts <laughs> us in when it's actual right. torture when you really want to sleep more than anything else and you're so exhausted and all you're doing is pushing the awake button, but you're so convinced that, that you need to do this to fall asleep. Exactly. And if that's a useful analogy, just take that take that example and then backcast it to everything I've said so far on this podcast. It's the same exact thing. It's just less obvious. In that example, nice. it's very obvious what's going on because you're not asleep. Whereas when you're trying to meet a deadline, when you're trying to catch a ball, when you're trying to get an erection, <laughs> right? All, yeah, <laughs> all of all of these things um, are the same exact bind. Yeah, that's brilliant. 
All right, man. So, so I tricked you there because I, I did have one more question, and that uh, <laughs> is it. Uh, is it possible to do intense, explicit thinking uh, in an expanded state? Then, because it feels to me like every time, oh, I gotta think this through, I automatically yeah. shift into this very contracted, uh, contracted state inwardly. Yes, I, it definitely is. Um, it's just very unfamiliar, and things that aren't familiar feel wrong, and that's why we don't do them. So when when you're with someone, and you know, let's just say that you had zero facial cues that you were thinking, you know, the other person will get a bit confused with whether that is like kind of completely blank, which is why the whole signaling benefit of looking like the thinking comes from. But when you're on your own, there's no value of that. So you can you can literally play with this. Of just you know, think really, really, really hard without using any muscles. Right? You don't need muscles to think. I promise you. You don't have to take my word for it. You don't need muscles to think. <laughs> I and you it. don't need to be you don't need to be focused down either. You can if you're in a quiet room, you don't need to be distracted, you can be in expanded state and you can think without crunching your face up. At first it'll feel weird, but yeah, you can totally play with that and it will it will work. Yeah. All right, so let's jump into some Twitter questions here then. All right. Um, let's see. So, um, yeah, our common friend, Lily Tanit, has asked, uh, common challenges in pursuing sustained non-doing and what to do about them. So I wouldn't seek sustained non-doing or sustained expanded awareness. To begin with at first, you just, as it comes up, you play with it. But don't let it become a thing you get attached to. Uh, my, you know, in my Zen practice, they say take some days off or take one day a week off, so you don't <laughs> get attached to the, to the practice <laughs> at that level of matter. And yeah, it's a kind of just repeat the question that was a bit at the beginning that I I want to kind of go back to, but I'm, I've, I've she asked about common challenges in pursuing sustained non doing and what to do about them, like obstacles you might face in your in, in your journey towards expanded awareness? Yes, yeah, so the main thing I guess to answer there is, and this comes from my own teacher again, um, he says that the present moment only lasts for three seconds. So it's not something that you can like expand and be in the world and then keep. You can't cling to it, you have to keep renewing it. It's a constant choosing. All right, so there's a sense of like, there it is, there it is, there it is. <laughs> Kind of, kind of process going on where you, you rehook to the world, rehook to the world, re-expand, re-expand, and it's it's that moment of choosing that is what we're talking about here. So it's not that you're you wake up in the morning, you do meditation, like oh, I'm undoing now, that's it, I'm I'm done for the day, and I just carry on undoing, <laughs> I'll carry on being excited <laughs> or being being mindful. For me now, it's almost like there's a module in my brain that is doing that scanning, or that kind of pinging the world, like there it is, there it is. It kind of gets quieter and, 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 and louder as I need to, but like my baseline awareness has gone up because of this. But to begin with, you might need prompts um, in, in life, you know, on your phone saying, hey, place behind you or on your monitor or when you go for a walk or, or, or these things just to remind you that in this moment, you need to play with this concept. Yeah. But it sounds a little uh, contradictory in the sense that, yeah, it's if it's supposed to be. Uh, a result of stop stopping doing things that you shouldn't be doing. I feel like once you 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 really realize that it's not helping you to do that. Let's say for sleep, for instance, then you should effortlessly stop doing that, and then the expansion should happen by itself. No, I think if only it were that simple. Um, we <laughs> have very very strong very strong habits. So you know you'll you'll have this moment once, and then immediately your habit will kick back in. Very quickly, actually, the the story of how Alexander himself like discovered this whole thing is relevant here. You know, he was a, a an actor, and he found that whenever he was on stage giving performance, he would kind of go into a performance mode. He would do performing, he would do speaking, and at the same time, he would kind of compress his his head backwards and down, which gave him voice trouble. And you know, he he noticed this in mirrors and thought, okay, I'll just stop doing that then, fine. But he couldn't stop it. He couldn't stop. The, the habitual response it was so ingrained and the technique was how to slowly unlearn how to kind of bring conscious control to them not doing that reaction so it's just yeah. you have decades worth of, of programming to undo you can't do it in one flash of insight yeah no that's fair enough 
Okay, so we have uh, someone named Claudia Gonella uh, who says, when you stop doing the wrong things, the right thing does itself. How to remember this? Uh, any ideas on how to remember to stop not noticing experience, for example? So I wouldn't say to stop noticing experience. Um, that seems like the opposite of what we're looking for. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what I, what I would say is, is to notice all the things that you want to habitually do and be non-judgmental towards them. And then is it, is this trick, uh, trick, no, no, a core skill, I should say, in as on technique is called inhibition, which is the ability to not respond to a stimulus. Now, the way this feels is what you did earlier around, okay, I can see my one is collapsing. I want this thing, this thing just trying to, to control my, my experience right now, and I'm not going to let it, which I will do yeah. by pausing on just my plane and expanding out again. So by letting the, letting that thing do itself is by is to not do any of the things that you think are right because they're wrong <laughs> because that's you like <laughs> posturing yourself if you like and you basically when when the right thing does itself you will be surprised you because you don't know how it does it you don't know how you walk or stand up and all that kind of stuff so you can't you can't try and do the right thing because that's the same trap as before you can just notice your habitual responses and kind of go no. No, yeah. <laughs> no, expand. But still have the intention. But still have the intention to to do the thing you want to do. And it's it's a strange thing at first. Yeah, for sure. And I know uh, it happens to me all the time because I'm a klutz. And uh, yeah. whenever I tip something over nowadays, I always have such a really good reflexes, and I catch something, and you get so mm. proud of yourself. But you have no idea right. how you did that. Uh, yeah, it's that. And that's kind of a, a little insight, a little glimpse into this state and what it's capable of. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, so let's see. Uh, someone named Ethan Cohen says, what's the interface like between Alexander Technique and technology media? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how to interpret that question. Do you have a, do you have a guess? I, I can say a few things to see what comes up. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I guess one, one comment is the... So I've been talking about habitual behavior and a kind of conditioning almost that, that the outside world imposes on us. And I can imagine that technology, well, I, I know that technology is kind of pushing us around in a very similar way. So not only are we learning virtual patterns, but we're having very highly paid intelligent software designers trying to hack our dopamine systems in the form of infinite feeds and that kind of thing. So I would say technology is, is great, obviously, but at the same time, it's you have to be much, much more aware of your use of it in, in the terms I'm talking about so as not to fall into a habitual collapse mode of being that I'm describing, which is why I used Twitter as an example earlier, because it's just so powerful if you're into it. Yeah. You know, the habit, there's a habit, there's a moment where you, you have the impulse to check Twitter. And that is exactly, in, that inter, internally, that impulse, that the idea that you could check Twitter is exactly the same kind of stimulus as I gave you. In a minute, you can pick up an object. Or pick, you know, an object to pick up. It's the same thing. It just comes from the inside. So notice when you have that that kind of, oh, I could check Twitter, your awareness narrows. You can notice that non-judgmentally and expand out again. And then you can choose, hey, I could check Twitter or I can go for a run. I have all the options available to me. I don't have to check Twitter. Yeah, or lay on the couch, which I would rather do. Yeah. Well, whatever you want to do, right? But you have the you have the option, <laughs> and this gives yeah. you your choice back. No, that's cool. And uh, yeah, Luli had another question here. Uh, yeah, is there a good feedback mechanism for practicing? How do you know when you're doing it right? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, so, so in a lesson, I would I'm able to notice people that they kind of. They're, they're behaving differently, but from an internal perspective, I've had people kind of report, you know, I, I noticed the birds singing more sweetly. I, you know, I had a, I found this thing that I only find unenjoyable and difficult. I found it easier and then more light somehow and more joyful. So I just say pay attention to your own subjective experience of, of the world and of your life and, and just notice if there are any subtle changes like that. Do things feel easier? Do things that used to be difficult suddenly become easy? Are you enjoying just going for a walk without a podcast on? <laughs> Whereas before you kind yeah. of zoned out the, the real world and just turned on the, the in a monologue um, by audio, like just kind of pay attention to it. 
Yeah. Now that's funny that you mentioned that specifically because for the first time in maybe years, I took a walk uh, yesterday without my headphones and I was trying to practice uh, the Alexander technique doing it. And it was really, really nice, actually. I enjoyed it a lot. So, um, well, that's, that's, that's great stuff. What was nice about it? Out of interest. Um, I mean, I guess th- there's always an accompanying feeling of I need something distracting, I suppose, or something to capture my attention. And uh, so I always turn to podcasts because I like information and I like listening to, to interesting things. And there's nothing inherently bad by that uh, about that. But there was something very light uh in my step when i was doing that and i felt very uh at ease in general and uh not, it, it, there's always an element for me of uh yeah coercion i guess when i'm listening too because i have to pay attention right? i have to listen to something i have to whereas here it was like oh i didn't even bring my phone i'm kind of just free and present in in what i'm doing here right now and it was very uh it allowed me to just relax in a different way, I think. Yes, and I, I'm going to bet that you're relaxed, but in an engaged, switch-on kind of way, not in the sense that you're collapsed on your chair when you think you're relaxing, right? Yeah, definitely. And, and, and every, yeah. yeah, and every Zen master that jumped up to hit me, I caught him. So I was really <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, in the it's, zone. It's, it's funny, so, you know, again, so Alan Watts talks about when you're left alone with yourself with nothing to do, there's a kind of a sense of discomfort, a kind of... Tick, 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 tick. and it's just kind of like I don't want to be alone with myself sense and that that discomfort with being alone with ourselves in the world drives us to distraction and that's when we kind of put the podcast on we, we don't want to be involved but what we find is like when you actually are in the world and you kind of pay attention to this way of describing it's actually okay <laughs> we yeah. kind of have to go through that <laughs> almost like yeah. the fear of death that this part of your brain has if it's not being engaged because if you see the world through that part of your brain and then it it goes away, then it dies. And that's terrifying for it. So it doesn't like that. But, you know, there's something beyond that, which is this being. No, definitely. And uh, I had another question that wasn't from Twitter, but that the uh, the previous guest I had on the podcast wanted me to ask you, uh, okay. which is, uh, yeah, do you see any physiologi- um, physiological correlates for progress in this? And I know you mentioned that, yeah, the, the, physio- the physiological part is not your strong suit here maybe or your focus but yeah are there any um any checkpoints uh that you can tick off uh in that sense so it really depends on the starting points um if you're someone who has a chronic pain or you know a pain somewhere or muscle tension what you might begin to notice is just kind of sudden and unexpected um release of that thing and you might even know that it not even know that it was there like, oh, hey, my quads just released for some reason. Oh, that was weird. Or yeah. I'm walking more lightly. Or, hey, no, my neck pain is kind of eased a bit. That kind of thing. Um, these things will kind of happen of themselves. You can't go off and try and do them because that's the same trap I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, okay, so lastly, we have two more questions from uh, from my dear friend, the Hermes of Reason. And uh, he has... Uh, attached his questions to tweets of yours specifically here <laughs> oh, no. so maybe so <laughs> so maybe i should actually read your tweet first so so first uh you have a tweet where you says where you say this is exactly what i'm getting at yes caring can be seen in some cases as a synonym for forcing you can often achieve so much more to a higher quality and with more enjoyment by loosening your grip on yourself and his question is, um, curious to know more of your thoughts on caring and how it can apply to relationships. So I, 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 kind, of, I kind of see caring as the manifestation of the, the doing, enforcing thing I was talking about earlier, except to kind of lay, lay it on with a kind of um, virtue that we think we have. So, you know, if you don't try hard, then you're not worthy kind of societal messaging, um, no pain, no gain kind of kind of language. And caring is caring is what happens in the difference between you know, you've got a deadline and it's a week away and it's fine and you're working at a relaxed and efficient pace. And then you know an hour later your boss comes in and starts like putting pressure on you. 
and something shifts at that point, which is you start caring, and your entire relationship with the thing you're doing changes. It becomes a kind of, your body gets tense, you start kind of getting emotionally invested in a different kind of way, and all of that is what I'm talking about is caring. Or, mm. you know, when when you're playing sports and you have to you know, you hit the ball forward, it's, you hit the ball, it's great, it's fantastic, relaxed, and then, you know, they throw it again, but this time, you want to impress people, you do it again the second time, you start caring about hitting the ball as well the second time, and you start involving yourself. That's what I'm talking about, it's that extra layer of conscious lack of trust, I might be almost say, over, right. before, before you trusted, now you care because you don't trust, and you have to kind of interfere. So that's what I mean. Yeah, so it's a form of, of, of clinging to an outcome rather than uh, having an intention to, to do something and then trusting in, in your ability or something exactly. like that. You can, yeah. you can just set an intention to do something and then let it happen. You don't need to be chiding yourself the entire time. But if, with the, the implicit fear there, the implicit assumption there is if you stop chiding yourself, then you won't do it. As if you're like, you're the parent and you're pushing the child version of you around, right? That's yeah. what caring is. Care, caring is the parent voice and the child is the response to that caring voice, which no one likes being forced around, which I'm sure you, you'll agree with, given your, um, <laughs> your philosophical starting point. Yeah. And I mean, the you're, you're going to get the Care Bears coming after you after this now when we release this, but <laughs> I guess it has to be worth it. Nice. But uh, yeah. so, yeah, let's end on this question. And this is more a, a philosophical one. And we alluded to this before. Uh, so Hermes Reason is asking, and this is the discussion I've been having with him recently, since experience is a form of memory at the level of the brain, what does it really mean to pay close attention to the present moment? And I'm going to let you answer, but I'll assume that you will answer the same way uh, that um, the, um, yeah, we're talking about our own experience, our own subjective experience of, uh, of the world. But yeah, do you, uh, do you have an yes. answer to that? It's the same as before, as you say. So you know, what we're playing with here is our own subjective experience. This is entirely subjective. Um, yeah. I'm making no claims about the nature of object level reality. And I'm not saying that by paying attention to this open awareness state that you are therefore not um, restricted by the physical limitations of your brain taking half a second to process the world or whatever it is that you're, you're experiencing through memory. Like, I'm, not, I'm not going there. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm... Whether you can use this interface to to go back directly, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's, it's not something I'm commenting on. That's an interesting question, but um, I uh, yeah, you, Michael, it's been a uh, uh, really fun conversation, and uh, I'm not going to take up more of your time. So, where can people find out more about you and your stuff if they're intrigued by this? Sure. So the best place is probably uh, on Twitter, where I am. Uh, at m um, underscore ashcroft and i have a, a thread of threads um which i'm playing with something about 35 now of these different ideas i'm playing with um i have a newsletter called expanding awareness at expandingawareness.substack.com um and that uh superman article is actually on my, my main website which is my yeah cool i will link to all of these three in the show notes cool, and uh, yeah i i hope we can talk uh, I, I hope i can get you back on the podcast sometime and uh Thanks again. It was a pleasure. Sure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.